Hi again, we will talk here about some of the diseases of the sclera, and there's only two that I want to talk about. Uh, certainly there's more disorders of the sclera that you could talk about if you want to talk to an ophthalmologist, but as far as what you're going to see in clinical practice in the ED, uh, in the clinic, this is pretty much it. Uh, so, and for the test, this is definitely it. Um, episcleritis and scleritis sound the same, but they're very different as far as prognosis, as far as management, uh, and what they mean. So uh, it's going to be very important to differentiate these two apart, as well as differentiate them apart from some of the other causes of red eye. So the episclera is the outermost layer of the scleral structure. When you think of the sclera, you think of the white of the eye, but you really have two layers there. You've got the episclera, which is on the outside, and the sclera, which is directly beneath that. And the episclera is the outermost layer, and it's comprised of loose fibrous elastic tissue. And it's separated from the conjunctiva. The conjunctiva would be uh, superficial to the episclera, so that would be on the very, very outside. Uh, it's separated, the conjunctiva and the episclera are separated by a vascular plexus made up of superficial and deep episcleral vessels. So if you go look at yourself in the mirror and you look for little tiny arteries in your eye, uh, you'll you'll see them, and what those little arteries or those little vessels are in between is the conjunctiva on the outside, and sitting on the episclera uh, deep on the inside. Okay, deep to the episclera is the sclera proper, so what we technically call the sclera. Uh, the sclera is opaque and fibrous and tough. It's made up of uh, type 1 collagen fibers, which organize very irregularly, and that's in contrast to the cornea, where the cornea is made up of uh, collagen fibers as well, but they're very well organized. And so because they're so well organized, uh, you can see through it. On the other hand, the sclera is made up of irregular, sort of, I don't want to say disorganized, because that's how it's supposed to be, but not well organized, not straight uh, collagen fibers. And so because of that, you can't see through it and it just appears white. The sclera is also consistent with the cornea, and uh, we know that uh, from if you've watched the cornea lectures, and uh, then also with the dura mater. And the sclera comes back around uh, the um, when it comes back to cranial nerve 2 and it provides sheath, which then is the dura mater of CN2. It's also a really good insertion point and is the insertion point for the extraocular muscles which help you move your eye and it's perforated by several nerve fibers and vessels. The sclera is a very innervated, sensitive, and vascular structure and we will certainly learn that when we find out how painful uh, episcleritis and scleritis can be. So episcleritis is a benign self-limiting inflammatory disease that affects the outer sclera and tenons capsule. Tenons capsule is just a little uh, sort of structure uh, that sits more in the uh, back of the eye coming up towards the eye, but you can't really see it because it's, it's behind the, the skull, or I should say behind the face. Uh, but it's just this capsule that the globe sits in. Uh, it can be inflamed, and that's called tenitis, um, or tenonitis, which shouldn't be confused with tendinitis, but we're not going to talk about that here. I just had to add that in for completion's sake. Uh, but episcleritis, it is inflammatory, but usually it's idiopathic in origin. About 67% of episcleritis cases, we don't know what causes them, or they're not linked to a disease that we traditionally associate with episcleritis. Episcleritis tends to not be a bacterial or an infectious disease. It's usually due to rheumatic diseases when we know a cause. And those rheumatic diseases include RA, uh, lupus, Wegener's, uh, polyarteritis nodosa, and then some others like uh, psoriasis. Um, I think uh, there's some more... Um, can be associated with uh, giant cell arteritis, uh, ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, that's all I can think of right now. Uh, but anyway, uh, you get the idea. Those uh, those sort of autoimmune rheumatic diseases 
Um, those are associated with episcleritis, especially RA. There are two types of episcleritis. Uh, we're sort of really uh, cutting this down here now. Uh, diffuse episcleritis, in which the entire episclera is involved, uh, and then a nodular episcleritis, in which more of a discrete portion of the sclera, I should say episclera, is involved. Uh, and in those cases, you might be able to notice a discrete nodule. So how do these patients present? They tend to have mild to moderate eye pain, not the worst eye pain they've ever had in their life, but pretty significant eye pain, enough to bring them into the ED. Uh, noticeable redness, of course, watery eyes, and this one stands out. If you touch the eye, they will be very tender to palpation, and that just has to do a lot with the nerves uh, that are in, the, uh, in that region. The differential for episcleritis, of course, we need to consider conjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis, though, involves only mild pain if there's any pain at all. Conjunctivitis is also much more common uh, because you can get it virally. And the redness in conjunctivitis will be more prominent towards the fornices, whereas episcleritis is more just generalized redness. And then, of course, we need to differentiate this from the much more severe scleritis. And scleritis pain is way more severe. It's severe enough to wake the patient up at night. Uh, they certainly won't wait to come in with that kind of pain. There may be reduced vision and, very importantly, congested vessels. The vessels that you see that make the eye red will not blanch with epinephrine drops. And this gets us to, oh, uh, we have some pictures here. So. Uh, here's a diffuse episcleritis. This one's diffuse too. Well, that might be a nodule there. I'm not sure on that one. This one's definitely nodular. You can see that nodule right there. And then this one's nodular as well. Okay, so... Um, training on from uh, that last slide of words. So because the major diagnostic question is distinguishing episcleritis from scleritis, because scleritis can destroy your eye, the best initial diagnostic step is going to be to infuse epinephrine or phenylephrine, phenylephrine drops into the affected eye. And the reason this is a good first step is because if it's scleritis, you want to know. You want to have an idea. If it's episcleritis, we can kind of let our guard down a little bit, and we certainly don't need to get on the phone and wake the ophthalmologist up at 3 a.m. So in episcleritis, there will be a reactive vasoconstriction, and so you'll see blanching. The eye will become less red and more white. Blanch. It's the French word for white. So... Uh, in episcleritis, you'll get that vasoconstriction. Also, if there's a nodule in the nodular episcleritis, you can gently manipulate it with a sterile cotton tip applicator if the patient lets you. Uh, but if you have the nodular uh, form of scleritis, that nodule will be fixed in place. So for treatment, episcleritis being a benign self-limiting condition doesn't necessitate treatment. However, the patient generally doesn't come to the doctor to get told, you're okay, go home. So you can do something. Uh, you can provide reassurance and symptomatic control. Uh, that would be uh, something like artificial tears. You can give them an over-the-counter NSAID, uh, ibuprofen, uh, give them um, Ketorolac, uh, whatever you want to give them, doesn't matter, PO NSAIDs will help with the pain to a certain degree, and then topical corticosteroids can help as well, because remember, this is an inflammatory process. Episcleritis typically resolves within 7 to 10 days. Smoking cigarettes does delay healing, and episcleritis only rarely complicates in scleritis. We're really not that concerned about it, but if it hasn't. We, we do want to provide patients with enough uh, information that if it doesn't get better within a week, then please come back and let's look at it again. All right.
I don't think there's anything more I wanted to talk about there. Okay. Okay, so scleritis is a much more problematic disease of the sclera, and it involves inflammation of much deeper tissue than the episclera. And it's also associated with chronic inflammatory disorders. Now, scleritis can be divided up into four different types. And we're not going to focus on these last two types. We're going to focus on these first two, diffuse scleritis and nodular scleritis. These other two are a little bit more difficult to diagnose. Generally, it's going to be the ophthalmologist that makes this diagnosis. And I've never, ever seen these come up on the USMLE in all the practice questions and all the tests I've seen. So... I wouldn't worry about these two, at least for test-taking purposes. What you do need to be aware of is the emergent nature of scleritis. So in scleritis, the patient will present with a deeply red and painful eye. This is very, very, very painful. You talk about the, the most painful things your eye can go through, apart from maybe having a knife stuck through it. There's acute angle closure glaucoma with really high intraocular pressure, and then right below that, just barely below that, is going to be the scleritis. This is very painful. And this pain is so severe, a lot of times it radiates down the cheek into the jaw, or it can radiate up into the temple. Uh, there's also usually decreased visual acuity. Uh, there can be photophobia as well as tearing. And this pain can be so severe that it awakens the patient at night, and even if the patient takes over-the-counter pain meds like Tylenol or Advil or whatever they've got in their counter, it's only temporarily responsive, if at all, to the pain meds. So here is a diffuse scleritis. You can see here it doesn't really look a whole lot different from episcleritis. So how are we going to tell them apart? Uh, so let's jump down here to the diagnosis. Uh, it's initially useful to differentiate scleritis from episcleritis with the use of epinephrine or phenylephrine drops uh, because if we find out that it blanches and it's indeed episcleritis, then we're a little, uh, it's kind of a relief and we don't need to call the ophthalmologist. Uh, however, in scleritis, there will not be blanching in response to these drops. And so in that case, you will, at 3 a.m., get on the phone, and even if the ophthalmologist is sleeping, you're going to call them, and they're, they're going to need to come in because this is, this is an ophthalmologic emergency if there ever was one. Another thing that's useful to do as well during the diagnosis is to get an intraocular pressure. Uh, however, scleritis and glaucoma are, are pretty different in that glaucoma, acute angle closure glaucoma, uh, has a pretty significant, much more significant effect on your vision, whereas with scleritis, you're usually able to see a lot better. So, jumping back up here, a full history is necessary, especially if there's no records on the patient, uh, because the likelihood of scleritis is higher if there's knowledge of a rheumatic disease. So if you have a 46-year-old woman with a history of rheumatoid arthritis, and she comes in with a red eye, we're much more concerned about scleritis or episcleritis than if it's a 19-year-old uh, or a 6-year-old boy who comes in with a red eye. We might not be as concerned about scleritis. We might be thinking of something like conjunctivitis. So that history of having a rheumatic disease is very important in putting scleritis or episcleritis higher up on your differential. Not that you have to have one of those. Two-thirds of people who get it don't have a rheumatic disease, but if they do have one, then it's good to know because it changes your, your, your differ the order of your differential diagnosis. Also, a good physical exam should also be performed, especially in the patients who don't have any known history of rheumatic diseases. And where are you going to focus? Of course, you're going to focus where the rheumatic diseases uh, will manifest themselves. So the skin, the joints, the heart, and the lungs. Okay, so once you've diagnosed scleritis, uh, you've got a red eye, painful, radiating, it's been there for maybe four, five, six hours, woke the patient up, they're in at the middle of the night, um, and they don't have any blanching in response to the epinephrine drops, then 
we've called the ophthalmologist, it is your responsibility to work the patient up for an underlying cause because there is a one out of three chance statistically that this patient does have a rheumatic disease and we just happen to not know about it. So you're going to order labs based on your physical exam findings, especially the very specific uh, labs. So uh, I wouldn't flood your your uh, if you're if you're doing step three. I wouldn't you know flood out with all the possible rheumatic labs you could possibly get. Uh, be judicious based on the patient's symptoms, what what they're presenting with. Uh, because otherwise, this can be really exhaustive. There's lots of rheumatic diseases that can uh, be associated with scleritis. So I would add at the very, very minimum to get a CBC, get a SED rate, and then get a rheumatoid factor because RA is so common, and that can also point to other things, and get an ANA and a uric acid. And those are good tests to use as a starting point, and then other labs can be ordered based on what you find clinically. Uh, the management, and I add that this is for the non-necrotizing versions of scleritis, would be to get give the patient PO NSAIDs unless contraindicated and pain control. Now the NSAIDs, you usually think of that as pain control. Not really, I mean it can help the pain, but that's not why we're giving them NSAIDs. We're giving them NSAIDs to help with the inflammation. The pain control will usually give them some kind of a narcotic uh, because the pain is that bad. And then, of course, can't emphasize enough, emergent ophthalmology consultation. Whenever it's scleritis, you want to get that ophthalmologist in ASAP. And then uh, you can also consult rheumatology if necessary uh, based on whatever you find from uh, your lab results or if you have difficulty uh, working the patient up. Other agents that can be used uh, include systemic corticosteroids that can be given either orally, pre uh, prednisone, or methylprednisolone. Uh, uh, now those are generally a second line, uh, but they can also be given in patients who cannot take NSAIDs for one reason or another. Beyond that, you can use immunosuppressives. Methotrexate tends to be preferred, but if the patient has a uh, collagen vascular disorder, uh, you'll probably want to put them on cyclophosphamide. And then beyond that, you've got biologics. And then antibiotic drops can be useful, especially if you have the patient on steroids, because there always is that possible risk that the patient has an infectious version of scleritis. Um, and so it can be judicious to have the patient on antibiotic drops. Um, but most of this will be at the call of the uh, ophthalmologist. What you need to know here is your basic management for scleritis, and that is to give them PO NSAIDs unless contraindicated. If it is contraindicated, give them systemic corticosteroids um, and drops at the, uh, I, I would err on the side of drops, antibiotic drops, but uh, ask your ophthalmologist. And then, of course, pain control and emergent ophthalmology consultation. And that is it.